Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is uh, 10 Strategies to Increase Your Contract Training Income in 2013. And we're very happy to have Julia King-Tamong of LEARN with us today as our presenter. And my name is Chris Murphy, and I'm with the company AugieSoft. And today's webinar is being brought to you by AugieSoft. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to run through some real general webinar guidelines. Um, throughout the course of the webinar today, we will be asking a couple of polling questions. And so you'll see those questions on your screen, and then you'll have about a minute to respond, and then we'll um, read the answers and continue on with Julia's presentation. Um, we are recording the webinar today, as we do all the best practice webinars we do here at AugieSoft. And then we will provide a link to the recording on the um, AugieSoft website, along with the copy of the slides. And so we'll get that up probably within the next 24 hours or so. So look for an email or notification on when that is ready. And then also, um, we'll leave some time at the end of the presentation for questions. So if you do have a question for Julia, if you could just submit that in through the questions box on the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen, and then we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end. And so with that, I think we're ready to go. And so Julia, um, welcome to um, the presentation. Thanks, Chris. And I just want to say happy holidays, everybody. I hope you're winding down wherever you are, getting things tied up. I just came back from a trip to British Columbia work trip, and I'm doing that myself. So I hope that's true for you, too, so you can have a little leisure here before we get started. And I thought it would be nice. This is a presentation that I did in Washington, D.C. at the LEARN conference. It was very popular. had uh, over 100 people there. And so I thought it would be nice to share with you uh, a, a seminar that had something to do with looking forward to 2013 and how you might be able to make some money. So before we get started on today's seminar, I want to take one poll, which Chris will help us with. And Chris, you want to put that poll question up for us? Sure. Um, so everybody, you should now see the first question on the screen, which is, how did your 2012 contract training income compare to 2011? And so we've got a couple of different uh, options for you to choose from. And so you just want to select what option works best for you, and then we'll read off the answers and continue on. What I'm finding in North America, and it's true both in Canada and the U.S., is as I travel around and I ask this question in person in contract training units and in other kinds of continuing education units, is that uh, where you live, the region that you live in, heavily affects whether this was a flat line year for you, or up or down in contract training. So I thought since we had uh, 40 or so of us together today that we would take a look and see you know, how last year went for you. And that's always a little bit of an indicator. The international polls for contract training uh, tell us that uh, international, I mean North American polls for contract training, tell us that last year contract training was up somewhere between 7 and 10 percent, depending on whose data you read. So. Now we'll take a look and see what you guys have to say about that. All right. So it looks like um, the majority, 38%, said that they have about the same or expecting the same income um, as last year. 21% uh, said a small increase. 7% uh, said that they're way up from last year, which is great. And 24% oh. said they saw a slight drop from last year and 10% um, saw a big drop from last year. So kind of a mix of responses, it looks like. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. And uh, I'll take a look at those numbers and ponder those a little bit <clears throat> and see if we can cross-reference those with where you're from when you said your income is up, down. And of course, it's institutionally individual as well. It can have to do with staffing and that kind of thing. So onward towards how to make more money, because whether you made less in 2012 or more or were flatlined, uh, it's very important to try to build gradually. Learn recommends at least 10% growth per year, and not too much more than that. Uh, if it's more than that, we want to just be really careful that you're staffing and resourcing up accordingly so that you can handle the business that you have. The last thing you want to do is sink yourself with your own success. So there are really four rock solid ways to build your business. And the first one is, of course, and it's the thing that we're always working on, to increase the number of clients that you have in contract training. So this can be done through cold calling, this can be done through buying mailing lists, this can be done through 
coordinating with the open enrollment side of the house. There's so many things that we can do to increase the number of customers or clients that we have. This would also in, uh, include asking current customers for referrals. So anything at all that you can do to increase the pool, of course, increases the number of contracts that you get. The second thing that you can do is increase the frequency that your clients buy from you. This is really, if you, for example, are a fan of fast food, and you go someplace like McDonald's, you know that they have a continuous stream of strategies to get you to buy there more often. So for example, they'll do games, they'll do special items, the, I don't actually go there, but the week or the month or whatever it is. They'll do, um, they have playlands for children, they have new toys. Those are all strategies designed to increase your frequency as a customer of McDonald's. And so we have to ask the question, same strategy will work for us, but we have to ask the question, what are the things that we can do to increase the frequency that our clients come to buy from us? The third thing that way that you can build your business in contract training is to, or any business for that matter, is to increase the dollar value of every sale that you make. And this seminar really is about those three steps, number of clients, the frequency, and the dollar value of each transaction for building your business. And then the fourth thing that you can do, and this is a slightly different tactic, but it's to increase the effectiveness of your contract training unit's business by delivering the products or services to reliable and consistent systems. And what I mean by that is be more organized and structure yourself so that when a client comes to get something from you, it's completely reliable, completely consistent. Uh, McDonald's, again, is a great example of a brand that's completely built its strategy on reliability and consistency. You can go anywhere in the world and you get pretty much the same level of reliability and consistency in that brand wherever you go. All right, so here are the 10 strategies. First one is to radically increase the frequency. That means how often that your customers come to see with you. Many of you offer certificate programs, which is one of the hottest ways to package programming right now. And the thing that we like about it is if I'm enrolled in a certificate, it automatically drives your frequency numbers up because instead of signing up for one class at a time, I sign up for three or four or five classes at a time. Here are some other strategies that you may not have thought of. Certificate programs are pretty widely used. Maybe before I go on to the second one, I could just say that I think that most of the clients that I work with could be doing more certificate programs. And one of the easiest ways to do that is just take out your catalog and get yourself some highlighter markers and start asking yourself the question, are there any groups of two to five classes that we could be putting together and just calling them a certificate? You can still leave those very same classes open for open enrollment seating and have them open for certificate programs. And I'm not saying certification like Microsoft Networks uh, engineer, not that kind of certification, but more certificates of uh, attendance. All right, the second thing that you can do is you can have preferred customer events. So you probably have some star customers, that 20% of uh, customers that give you 80% of your income. Every once in a while, do something just for those people. People like to be treated as VIPs. They like to be recognized for the benefit that they bring your business. So offer a little something and say, this is really for our top flight clients. The, the lure of that or the invitation of that uh, is very successful for some units in some places. Another way to get people to come more often is by increasing the frequency with which you communicate with them. If at the very least, you should be doing a once a month email, literally two or three paragraphs of interesting trip, tricks or tips that your customers can use, something of value to people in that industry. Don't spend a lot of time on this stuff, but if you do send it out, what we know is one screen maximum, a little bit of color on the page, have the title line, uh, something like, you know, the monthly tips and tricks from whatever college, something like that, so they can search and find all the back issues easily or forward them easily, or I just at least come to recognize it. Sometimes you can give inducements for frequent buying, and so that would be sort of buy one, get one free, or any kind of bulk buying strategy. Learn has done quite a bit of research on which of those work well. We know, for example, that two for the price of one works better than 50%, and we've got some other tips in there that you can find out about by searching our article database 
at the LEARN website. Of course, you'll increase the frequency, and this is a great time of year to do this, to get out and see your clients and talk to them. I was up in uh, British Columbia this week, and I landed a couple of contracts really by just getting face-to-face -face with clients and saying, hey, I haven't seen you for a while and just wanted to check in because I'm not up here very often. I just want to see if there's anything that, that uh, I can do for you or that I can help arrange with another provider for you. Anytime you've got new products and services. Now remember that one of the things that's going to keep you um, ahead of the game in contract training right now is to sell more than training. If you've limited yourself to classes, then you're not doing enough. You need to be doing consulting and other products and services. So anytime you add a new product service or a new provider, new consultant or whatever, make a little bit of announcement about that. It just is a memory jogger to get your clients in. Some of our contract training units right now, and these are generally those that have, mm, say, four or more staff, are starting to use inside staff to do pre-calls for their salespeople. So that means basically those inside salespeople, we call them, are doing cold calls on the phone and getting appointments for their salespeople. Be sure that you've got adequate new programming. We find that frequency numbers drop off when you're not producing enough new programming. How much is enough? 20 to 30% new things per year. Another thing that will drive frequency up is if you take your programs that are successful, so look for your top 10 programs, and offer a level 2 or an advanced level or a black belt level or an institute or a, a, like a boot camp version of those things. And then the last thing is talking to your star clients, those 20% that bring you 80% of your business, and asking them face-to-face -face generally, What's the, what are the changes in their industry? What's going on for them that uh, you should be making some programming around? So that's a lot of stuff all designed to increase the frequency of business. The second thing that you can do to get yourself money is cut development costs. You've been working with me for very long. You've heard me say it over and over and over again. We waste too much money on development costs. One of the places where I see programs wasting a lot of money is by creating programs that have a short shelf life. Now, in some things, like certain kinds of healthcare classes or technology classes, there's not much you can do about that because the technology changes so fast that you're going to have to go through and pay your instructors, your trainers, to update the program at pretty much every year. <clears throat> but you might be able to decrease the development costs by creating some programs, like soft skills are fantastic for this, negotiation, conflict resolution, communication skills. Those programs can be developed and you can offer them three years later and use the exact same program, and this stuff is still relevant and still, still cutting edge. So we want to be careful about having technology be too much of your offering, more than 30 40%, for example. Also, you can cut development costs by using people who are instructional systems design, ISD pros. That is, people who are not taking three months to build a class, people who can build a one-day class in two, three days. And that would be very experienced. Uh, course builders. That'll cut your development costs a little bit. They'll charge you more, but they'll take less time to do it. Be sure that you're recycling and upcycling content. And I'll talk just more about uh, what that is, but that'll help you cut your development costs. You can bounce off canned content. And what I mean by that is if you've seen or ever been to a class and it was good, you can just remember what were the principles that made the class good and then develop from that. Anything that you can do to learn about rapid instructional design development methods, and those generally have to do with developing the course in reusable chunks of content, which can then be used to build other similar courses. All right, the third thing you can do to increase your income for 2013 is be sure you're getting enough follow-on business. It's really important that you train your, your most frequently used instructors uh, right after a course is over to talk it up a little bit about what a, a best next step scenario would look like. So if you've got people from a lot of different companies in a class, and that's sometimes the case if it's not just a fully customized course, then of course you're just going to say, you know, so today we talked about communication skills, and a good next step would be X, Y, Z. I also think it's a good idea to put good next step information on the back of the tent cards, the main tent that people put on the table to say, if you're enjoying today's class, you might also be interested in these follow-on classes. Be sure you put all the information that somebody would need to register there. So if they need a course number or something like that, uh, let them know and put the dates of the courses so people can sit right there with their iPad or the Blackberry and get that loaded into their calendar. Another way to get off uh, follow-on business is to 
tell me that you'll give me a discount if I buy in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. So that uh, will help your salespeople you have a kind of predictable flow of business, and it'll help motivate people to sign on. So you don't have to actually wait until the end of the job to get the next job recommendation. You can do that in the middle of a job. And the reason I say you want to use your most experienced instructors to do this is you don't want anybody hard selling uh, in, the, in the class itself. So you want people who are savvy enough around sales just to make the suggestion and, and nurture the lead, but not really to force a close on anything. All right, Chris, we've got our poll question number two here. Can you tell us what that is? Yep. Um, thanks, Julia. So now the next poll question should be up on the screen for everybody. And the question is, what do you do to get follow-on business from current customers? And so we've got a couple of different options for you to choose from. So if you can go ahead and um, pick the ones that work for you, then we'll uh, read off the answers here after about a minute or so. Okay. While you're doing that poll, I'll just give you one more idea for getting follow-on business, and that would be to get your follow-on business during the quality assurance visit. So if you're a LEARN client, you know that we recommend that all contract training sales events have a 10 to 15 minute follow-on, whether it's by the phone or face-to-face -face in person, doesn't really matter. If it's a client with a lot of money who might buy from you, I would drive across town to make it happen, but otherwise I'd get on the phone. And just really the quality assurance visit is checking in with the client and seeing, did we keep our learning, teaching commitments to you? And if we didn't, what do we need to do to make sure that we've done what we said we'd do? Uh, at that time is a great time to say, by the way, based on the evaluations, you'll see that there, there appears to be a need for whatever the follow-on business is. So what did we learn, Chris? All right. So uh, it does look like the most um, people are using your suggestion to follow, to do follow-on work as part of the quality assurance process. So 41% said that that's what they're doing. 35% said they start selling immediately after a conclusion of a project. Um, and then 12% are offering discounts. And 6% are providing mid-job recommendations and um, asking their instructors to recommend follow-on work for them. I really like that. More than 75% of you are out there getting work right on the tail end of the job. And I don't know about you, but I would so much rather do that than drive across town and have to make a cold call or even a warm call for that matter. And those of you who are in the Midwest today, I think, and Chris is saying, had a big snowstorm there recently. So uh, that's all the more reason to stay in your office and uh, use whatever convenient connection you have with the client rather than having to make a separate sales call. The fourth one, now this is a strategy we all know about, but how, many, how often are you actually asking for leads from your clients? What I like to say is anytime somebody says to you, wow, that was really fantastic, ask them if they know a couple of other people who might be interested in this course or a course like this. If somebody gives you leads, you, you probably have two or maybe even three people who are a steady stream of leads for you. They're kind of in the category of colleague friends. For those people, I would, if you actually get business from their leads, I would have some sort of system in place to track that and to send them thank you notes or gift certificates for coffee place or just some little simple way of thanking and appreciating and nurturing those people for you because actually they're doing your salespeople's work. And if you're the salesperson, you'll appreciate how uh, fortunate that is to have that. Also, you might want to put a line. This is a very passive way to do it, so it's absolutely no extra work for you. But you might want to have a line on your evaluation sheet that says, do you know anyone else inside your company who might be interested in this? And if so, you know, could you have their contact information, email or whatever? It's a very simple thing. It won't net you a lot more leads, but it will net you enough leads that you'll be glad by the end of the year that you put it on there. It only takes one or two leads in the whole year from a line on the valuation sheet to make you feel like that was a good investment of uh, space on the paper. About 25% of your business should be coming from leads next year, about 25%. All right, method number five is be sure you're upselling. Train your staff to upsell. Upselling means you're out on a needs assessment and somebody says, I need a class in team building. And so upselling asks the question, 
is there any way that we could sell products and services to this client that would serve them better than the thing they originally asked for? So what we're really saying is, you asked me for a one-day class, but you would be served better by a one-day class plus two hours of follow-on consulting or maybe coaching or access to a website that has you know, 50 downloadable handouts on the topic. Those are all upsells. That is, you're going to charge more if they take these additional services. I feel strongly that we should upsell when the thing that we're upselling to actually benefits the client more. The client doesn't really know your products and services well, certainly not as well as you, and this is the kind of thing where you want to get your structure, instructors or consultants involved. You may not even know what an upsell would be. So when I go out on a needs assessment call and I have um, a, an instructor or a consultant with me, I ask them while we're in the car driving over there, what would the upsell be? So if we're going to the client to talk about X, what would X plus be? And, and have them say, you know, we don't want to push this on the client, but if it's something better for the client, it'll give them a better result for their money, better bang for their buck, then we'd want to upsell that. Number six is a phone call or a face-to-face -face visit thing, and that's letting your most loyal clients, your star clients, know in advance about any special deal that you have. Really, this is just an excuse to uh, make them feel good, to let them know that you value their business above kind of average business, and also it's just a, an excuse to get on the phone and say to a client, hey, we've got a deal coming up, you know, sign up, sign up in the next 30 days, get 10% off, that kind of a deal. We've got that coming up, and I just wanted to let you know first. Everybody likes that. Um, don't you like getting those little advanced postcards in the mail that say your favorite clothing outlet's having a sale on sweaters? We wanted to give you two weeks' notice so you could get in and get the, the stuff that you really like the most. The seventh strategy is to position yourself further up market. And what I mean by that is as I've gone around in the last year and I've met with you and people like you in contract training units and community ed units, parks and rec units, what I see is that we tend to undervalue and therefore to underprice our services. We don't have enough clustered pricing. So I do think it's important to have inexpensive things that are good value for the dollar. I do think it's important to have a bare bones contract offering, you know, one day class with no frills, no coffee breaks, no lunch. No, I think it's important to do that. But you do have a small handful of clients who would like, who would enjoy, and who could afford to have a more VIP level service. So be careful that you don't niche yourself as the bargain basement training organization in your area just because you're a public institution. So the, the result of doing that is that people will often say, well, we don't want to use them for training because you know they're kind of the, uh, the low end of the, of the uh, spectrum of quality, when in fact it may not be true that you're the low end of the spectrum of quality at all, you're just the low end of the spectrum of price. But people often relate price and value. And so all I'm saying is that you should position yourself on a certain percentage of your courses, your customized stuff, your consulting services, as, as an organization that has access and that offers customized high-end stuff. So put you further up market more in touch with bigger opportunities, bigger clients, and therefore more money. Even if you had 10 to 20 percent of your business that was upmarket business, that would be really good. And it also strengthens your position so that somebody that's coming to you to buy your low-end stuff feels like, well, we did get a good bargain from this, this place that does really high-end stuff. I think you'll find that this is pretty good. It's the rough equivalent of you're walking into a clothing store and you're looking at what they have to offer and you see it's all really nice, uh, all natural fiber clothes, nicely designed, probably going to last a very long time. But then you find something that's a little less expensive and you think, oh, this is also uh, the quality that I need, but what a bargain. Well, it's a bargain relative to the other stuff on the rack. This is the same kind of concept. Number eight, the strategy to earn more money next year is to charge what you're worth that is not to overcharge. I'd never recommend that. Charge what you're worth, but be worth more. So this year, before 2013 gets here, get yourself a cup of coffee or a glass of eggnog and sit down and try to say, what are the, what are the products and services that we could offer that we could add on to things 
that would increase our value to the client. Let's just take down this look down this list as I'm looking at it. Probably you know you, you know what these things are, but let's take a look at level three evaluations. This is one that will barely cost you any time, energy, and money, but it will help you be worth more from the perspective of the client. A level three evaluation means that you say to the client, um, six weeks to three months after the class, depending on how complicated the skill set was that you, you were teaching, I'm going to get back with you and I'm going to do a survey of some or all of the people who attended the class. I'm going to ask one question, uh, maybe two questions. Did you use these skills? And if so, how did it go? Because if the people used the skills, but they ran into some problems, you want to know that. And one of the reasons you want to know it is because it's probably an indicator of what their next training should be. That's the level three evaluation. Only about 20% of the training units in North America who did training did a level three evaluation last year. And I personally think it's the gateway to quite a bit more business. Another way to be worth more that people often don't think about is to be first to market. So if a new version of the software comes out, are you ready to teach that software the minute it comes out? One of the ways that you can make that happen is by having your instructors and your consultants be beta test sites, for example, for new software or somehow on the cutting edge. And you can play a role in that. So have a talk with them and ask them how would that happen. Number nine, you know, we're all busy. You're busy, I'm busy, your customers, my customers, everybody's busy. And so it's often the case that they don't know everything that we do. Learn found in the last couple of years that even for our own business, this was so important that we had a staff person go out and just call. Literally, we gave her a membership list and we said, call people and we have a record, of course, customer um, management record that tells us what our customers have used among the free services that we offer and what they've bought. And we really started those phone calls with, hey, you know, we've got five or six new free things and we've noticed that you haven't uh, contacted us to be able to use those. And so we just want to be sure that you know about it. So we'd like, if it's okay with you, to send you something, an email that explains those free products and services to you. If the person says yes, then we'll send them that and then we may via email or via phone, contact them again and say, in addition to those free things, of course, we offer these other things. And these things are not free, but we think that we find them of high value. It's just that our customers don't know everything that we do. If you add 10 to uh, 20 to 30 percent new products and services each year, your customers are not tracking that. That's not their core business. So they need that reminder from you. And when you remind all of the customers, a certain percentage of them for sure will end up buying something. Number 10, I've been a big fan of recycling, repurposing, and repackaging in all walks of life. It's a great thing to do, you know, doing art at home with scraps from the kitchen, that kind of thing. Well, this is the business equivalent of that. So take a look at all the packages that you have, all of the consulting services that you have, and ask yourself the question. And I would do this. When I say ask yourself, I would be using my consultants and my trainers to do the bulk of the work on this, but I would ask them, is there a way that we could create service packages? So can we reconfigure what we do? Can we take one training and hook it up to another training? So if we take a class and add a webinar or a webinar series to it, even if the class is by one instructor and the follow-on webinars are by somebody else, what are all the different ways, uh, kind of a little bit of a shell game, that you could mix up the things that you offer and create new packages. For sure, if your instructors will do that, and I just did this recently with some of the stuff that I offer, it didn't take me very long. I spent about an hour on it. But I think uh, when I send that to learn, that will be very helpful so that the staff people can say, well, there's all the different ways we can mix and match these things. We do this because it takes the problem solving off the client's plate and puts it on ours. Now, I said we were going to talk about 10 strategies for making more money, but it's the new year and I feel like being super generous this year, so I thought we'd look at some more. Strategy number 11 is for you to expand your reach. So there's three ways we can get attention. We can buy it, that would be advertising. We can beg for it, that's PR, you know, please notice us. Or we can bug people one at a time, that's sales. 
or you can earn attention right now using social media. And one of the ways that you can, by social media, I mean things like a blog or Facebook, Twitter, those kinds of things, or by giving away an ebook on your website. What I mean by earning attention is that you're giving your clients valuable information at their request. So you're saying, we'll send you this stuff if you click on this link. When they click on the link, they're going to give you their name and their email address. Otherwise, how are you going to get it to them? And then you're going to have that name and email address to send them other valuable things. And I am not suggesting that you start a spam campaign. That won't yield you anything. What I'm suggesting is that you continue to create a slow but steady stream of important videos or research reports or interesting photographs, or e-books about their business, even if these things are half a page or a page, make it something that the client will value. Number 11 is one of the things that Learn's been using extensively this year. And we found that a simple campaign, uh, offering you a 10-page paper for free, you get that. Then we follow that up with another free paper. These are very valuable papers. Normally, the clients would be paying for these things. And then on the third step of the campaign, we might say, I might send out, for example, something that says, I uh, hope you enjoyed those two contract training papers that we sent for free. And I just want to let you know that we have a conference coming up in April in Chicago. Here's a link if you want to learn more and or register. That first time we used that campaign, it netted us $26,000 worth of additional business. You might like to learn more about that. I'm very excited about expanding the reach with social media. All right, strategy number 12 is get some discounts going this year. What I would do, and this will primarily be for your open enrollment stuff, not the contracted stuff, so you could do some contract discounts. Um, be careful with your pricing if you do that. Don't give away something. Just reduce, reduce the profit, but don't give it away and lose money on it for sure. Pretty much any kind of discount you offer will work. We do know, for example, that two for the price of one, or three for the price of two, or four for the price of three, outsells the exact same equivalent as a discount, like 50% off, 30% off, or whatever, every single time. So if you're going to do um, a discount like 50% off, do the two for the price of one instead. But you can do all kinds of creative discounts. Spring is almost here. We hope that was the last snow of the year. 12-12-12 uh, discount, whatever you want to do, they'll all work. Strategy number 13 is to be the expert's expert. If you're a large contract training unit, or if you're a unit that has a vertical niche expertise, maybe you do a certain kind of something or other in a certain kind of greenhouse, and you're the only people in the province to do it, if you've got those kinds of expert's expert stuff, uh, culinary program, that kind of thing, then if you've set up a program that really works, maybe even a truck driving school or something like that, do remember that you could become the source of setting up such a program. And you could go to the next state over, or to the next province over, and you could contact the schools in that area and say, we'll come over and set this program up for you for a fee or for a percentage of your profits or whatever it is. You could put it all together in the way that franchises do that. That's a little more labor intensive. But at least you could advertise, advertise the setting up of those programs as part of the services that you offer. So the clients that you have there would be um, uh, not the individual businesses, but other schools. In, in, in effect, your competition. All right, number 14, step 14, is that you can make more money if you implement a reminder system. So again, this one hinges on the fact that you're busy, I'm busy, and all of our clients are busy. So we need a tickler system in our own calendar that says we need to do X to increase business right now. I don't know about you, but if I don't have something that tells me to send out a newsletter or write a blog post or whatever it is, I'll completely forget about it. And because we've got so many strategies going on, because we're using social media, because we need to make cold calls, because we need to do quality assurance calls, it starts to get to be quite complicated to track. And that means that it needs to be on some sort of a calendaring system. And this is where uh, 
a customer relationship management software is a very helpful thing to do, and especially, especially if it's integrated. So I guess that was my little plug for Augusoft. Maybe you take a look at that since they're nice enough for us to offer us these free webinars. All right. Number 15 is to endorse other people's services. This is a little something that I learned watching social media. So the, the kind of loser approach to social media is to get on your blog or to get on your Facebook page and say how great you are. But what I watched for a couple of years was on social media how successful businesses talked about how great other people are. So-and-so has written a great marketing white paper. So-and-so gave a great uh, uh, stand-up presentation, and here's a video clip of that. So-and-so did this. And it's a steady stream of talking about the goodness of the people that you affiliate with. Part of the reason this works is because it, it helps us not be blowing our own horn, which is tiresome, doesn't it? It helps us talk about the success and the goodness of others, which is also a roundabout way of saying, I affiliate with high-quality professionals. It also helps us help clients and the people who work with us to expand their network of successful people. And I think that it helps build their confidence in us when they understand that we're associated with those people. And then at the same time, it says to the client, I'm paying attention to this stuff so you don't have to. You can relax. I'm doing this homework for you. So when you want to know who a good presenter on XYZ is or who the latest thinking on social media marketing is, you can just come to my web page or you can count on me to send that out to you in email. I think that's a great value-added service that we can do for our clients and it's a real feel-good thing. It will also build you um, collegiality among all those people whose products and services you recommend. There's really two ways to do that. One is to go to other people's websites and leave positive, supportive comments. And then the other one is to bring their stuff over to your website by linking to it. Take you a while to figure out how to do this, but you've got somebody on your campus who's savvy in social media who can help you get your brain around that. And again, you'll be applying it to this reminder system that I talked about. All right, Chris, do we have any questions out there? What we can do at this time is I've talked now about 15 ways that you could ramp up marketing and ramp up income in 2013. And we've talked about everything from increasing the frequency, increasing transaction costs, and a number of other strategies. But maybe you have questions about some of those or some other questions. Or maybe you have a suggestion that I didn't give. Chris, we got any questions? I um, just wanted to remind people, if you do have a question, to send that in through the questions um, box. Um, most of the questions so far have just been asking about the PowerPoint and the um, recording. And just as, again, a reminder, as I mentioned at the beginning, we do always record the webinar and provide a link to the recording. And then we also always provide copies of the slides for everybody after this. So we will definitely be providing that for everybody who's asking. Um, so if you do have a question for Julia, we'll take the next few minutes here and respond to those. And also, I just wanted to mention, uh, Julia, you did mention the, um, the marketing aspect. And um, again, not to toot our horn too much, but we did recently also um, have a partnership announcement with a, an online marketing software um, tool called Janu that works with um, with Lumens now, and that does help with a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, marketing um, type activities that uh, Julia was um, outlining before. So we'd be more than happy to talk more about that offline if anybody's interested. Um, but we do have a couple questions here. Um, any specific tips for association management as opposed to universities? Well, I think most of the things that I talked about could be re-engineered to work for associations. So I'm glad that you brought that up because it's, it's slightly less of what I was presenting. But I actually think that most of the things that we talked about, let's go through these things. Of course, this one would apply to associations, right, by just talking about other related associations or people that you've met in your association work. Of course, if you're running an association, you're going to have an uh, uh, a reminder system. Any association that figures anything out, including how to run successful training events, 
can become an expert's expert for another, especially non-competitive association. Though many associations are understaffed and, and really wouldn't be able to do this. The way that you would do this is by offloading this to uh, a consultant of some kind. Associations can definitely do discounts, right? And if you're an association and you're not yet using social media in an expert way, for heaven's sakes, get on the bandwagon. And if you don't know what that would look like, then if you're a LEARN member, definitely go to LEARN and talk to Suzanne Cart or Heather Dimmitt or email me if you forget their names and I'll, I'll help hook you up. But we know how to use social media and we can get you going on that. Definitely associations, if you've got any kind of training, you can do the recycle, repackage, repurpose thing. It's a little bit less applicable to you than it would be to a community college, say. Associations, absolutely, whenever you do an event like a conference, or if you have a place on your website, be sure that you're making it clear to your customers what it is that you do because your customers are clueless about that just like everybody else's customers. And often, we're so familiar with what we do, we just forget to tell our clients. So that's definitely one that you can do. And then let's see, I would say positioning yourself further up market, very important, uh, meaning that from time to time you ought to have some events or some services that are available to people, white papers and those kinds of things, online courses that are executive level products and services. So that's just back through strategy number seven. You can go through one through six on yourself and see which ones are applicable to associations, but quite a bit of crossover, I think. You got another question, Chris? Yeah, we've got a couple now. Um, another question we have is can you give some more examples of course add-ons or what you've called um, service packages? Yeah, let's go back to that slide. Here we go, service packages. So for example, let's say I come to buy a class from you. You might suggest to me, uh, actually I just did this with a client and it worked great. And it, it only added about $300 to the contract, but I thought it was really beneficial to the client. And that was about maybe $150 extra profit on the contract. And that was to offer a pretest and a post-test to prove learning. This client wanted to do that because they felt like if we proved learning through the course that they would be able to turn back around and ask for more money for training. And so this, the service package in that case was a pretest and a post-test. Sometimes somebody says they want a class and they do need a class, but actually I get the sense in the needs assessment that that maybe we don't really understand the problem that we're trying to solve with a class. And then maybe part of the problem is solved with a class, but maybe part of it is also a consulting issue. And so I would say, let's bring a consultant in and let's try to learn more about this problem. Because I hate to see people spend all of their improvement dollars on a class if a class will only improve or solve part of the problem. So in that case, the service package would be problem solving consulting in the class. I've got another class going on, so I have an active contract that has this next one, which is the class and some mentoring. So this is one that I often create the service package at the end of the class. So I'll say, as I did last week, uh, we've done this class and some of the skill sets that we worked on today were quite complicated, a little bit difficult to learn in a one-day class. So now you know the skills that exist, but maybe you would like to work on this one-on-one -on -one with me through Skype calls. And if you want to do that, you just talk to the contract training administrator down the hall, and you'd set that up, and I told them about what it would be, you know, more or less, it'll cost you about this much. And so we got two people out of that communications class who signed up to do a couple uh, of half-hour Skype calls so that they'll go out, try the skill set, come back in a couple of weeks, get online with me, talk for half an hour. So again, this is just a few hundred dollars, but if you're doing 100 contracts a year and you're adding a few hundred dollars, to those contracts, it's quite a bit of uh, impact on your bottom line. Another popular thing that's very easy to roll out is to have a class and to say, now there's more we could learn on this, so I could make available to you six webinars. And usually I use asynchronous webinars, which means they're canned and they're online, and people can choose from among the six. They can do one or none or all six, doesn't affect the price and access to those webinars is a certain amount of money. So that would be another thing that you could do. So those are some ideas of what service packages might look like. Your instructors will be able to help you develop effective service packages. 
Anything else, Chris? Yeah, we got a few more questions here. Um, another question we have is, how do you get well-paid university faculty to teach non-credit? Uh, what are some non-monetary incentives we could provide? You know, it's always really tough to work with university faculty, and, and it depends on the expertise and the department and all of those things. But of course, one of the problems that you're going to run into is they're actually overbooked. And if the money that you're offering is not the incentive, then why would they work with you? There's very little incentive to do that. That's the truth. It's hard. And my first question would be, do you really need, do you have to use your university faculty? So if your clients are saying, we want university faculty, which frankly is not very often that they're saying that, but if they're saying we really do want to use university faculty in a non-credit course, then I would say you, you will have to pay the, the university faculty enough to make the pay itself the incentive. Every once in a while, you'll get somebody who wants to go out and work with a private for-profit business or with a nonprofit to keep their, till, their skills at cutting edge. And that would be the main incentive. You'll go out and you'll rub elbows with, with um, uh, business people who are doing cutting edge stuff as opposed to the theory, which is often you know, not kind of out in the trenches related stuff. And sometimes that's an incentive for certain kinds of faculty people. Otherwise, I wouldn't actually use faculty people. They're more expensive. You get uh, insurance and other kinds of benefits that you have to pay. And you're, it's often a little bit of a nightmare to get them incented. Uh, but the way to do it usually is with money. And that would say, if you're having a problem with that, that you're not following the guideline, that the pay is not a set formula. You don't say we pay people 100 bucks an hour. You say we pay them whatever we think the client will pay, and we mark it up approximately 100%. So LEARN's got a lot of formulas for that that you probably already know about. Have another question, Chris? Yeah, we've got a couple more here. Um, if you could share a little more information about the Level 3 evaluations. Yeah, the Level 3 evaluation is just such a fantastic thing to do. So Level 1 is the smiley sheet we do at the end of class on a scale of 1 to 5. How would you feel about this or that, this or that? About 80% of the people who do trainings do that thing. Level 2 measures, did you learn anything in the class? So that would be a pre-test and a post-test would tell you that. A level three evaluation says, all right, if you learned something and you went out and you tried to implement what you learned, what happened? Did it work? In which case, that's great. And, and maybe they're excited to buy the next class because they're seeing that they're going to make more money or make more widgets or whatever based on what they learned. But the more interesting question from our side is, when you went out to try this new skill, did it not work? Let's say, for example, that I've trained a group of salespeople. Let's say they sell construction equipment. And I trained them in, in five new closing techniques. And so for three months, they go out and they try those new closing techniques. And then I send them an email. Uh, did you use this stuff? Probably they did. And did it work for you? And if not, what was the obstacle? If I read those, let's say there were 20 people in the class, if I read the evaluations and they say, okay, the obstacle was in this one close, it's a five-step process, and I couldn't remember what the process was, well, that tells me they need a little job aid. And maybe I just put that together and send it out for them pro bono. Maybe they say, you know, it sounded pretty easy in class, and the exercise we did was pretty easy, but actually out in the field, I ran into these three things. Well, maybe that tells me what my next blog article should be about. Or maybe that tells me, maybe somebody says, I tried it, and it was really great, but I wish that I knew something else, a related skill. Well, maybe that, at that point, I could go back to the manager and say, you know, your people are using this, but they need a little bit of training in X. And maybe we could just do a one-hour uh, online course, uh, a live, a synchronous thing, where people could ask questions like you are here today. Or maybe I could recommend at that point, I could say everybody is 90% of the way there, but they're all having one-off issues. And so what I'd like to recommend is that you purchase three hours of Skype call time. And I'll just meet with people for however long they want, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, one hour, to give them a little bit of one-on-one -on -one coaching. What the level three thing does is it tells us where our next service to the client is, which always is an income-producing uh, activity, right? And then it also helps us develop better courses because it says where we fell short. You know, 
But in the end, what it does for the client is it helps the client get 100% of the benefit from the class, not 90, not 80. Anything else? Uh, kind of a follow, excuse me, follow-on question to that was, would a pre-test and post-test have the same questions? Ah, well, you know, test engineering is quite a sophisticated skill set. Uh, it can have the same questions, or it can be different questions. And if it's different questions, you want to be sure, of course, that the, um, that the questions are really checking in with the same knowledge, skills, and attitudes that the pretest did. So I would go to your testing center and talk to your testing experts about that. You can do either strategy. There's upsides and downsides to both. The downside to using the same questions, and that's the easiest thing to do, of course. And mostly that would be OK. But the downside to it would be that knowing the questions will give you a little bit of test advantage. Just like the second time you see it, you're more likely to get it right. All right. Anything we've else? got a couple here. Um, is there a payoff? for preparing higher quality marketing materials and what percentage of budget should be marketing? Yeah, you should be spending about 0 to 5% and really not 0. You should be spending 5% of your income for your unit on marketing. Mostly, you know, if, if we're talking about community ed in general, that number's up around 15 or 20%. Don't quote that statistic, but something like that. But in contract training, the number is much lower because our marketing is face-to-face -face done by salespeople. But we do need some printed materials. Those printed materials should not exceed uh, all of your marketing efforts, should not exceed. So I'm not talking about salespeople's salary and benefits. That comes from your admin costs. But the printed stuff, expense for social media, that kind of stuff, should not exceed 5% of the income for the department. And you should be spending that. People who underspend on marketing, it shows up in their bottom line. We really see it. So then the question, your question, I think uh, I heard Chris say is, is there a payback for high quality materials? Well, to a point, the sweet spot is 5% of your income. But what we don't find a lot of payback for is, uh, I had, it, was, it was kind of a, a practice, and definitely not a best practice, but a practice among some of my contract training clients for a while to produce very expensive videos. And I got to tell you, the payback on that was just about zero. So you can get to a point where it's too slick for your audience. And I would rather see you have a well-designed, high-functioning black and white piece than I would pour a lot of money into a poorly designed four-color piece. So your clients are busy people. You have to compete. But as public institutions, they expect you that you might be a little less flashy than your private for-profit counterparts. The thing that sells contract training is contact with clients. People sell contract training, not paper. But you've got to have a little paper. Next. Um, all right, one last question, which I think is kind of a good lead into your kind of just um, more information slide. And um, somebody wants to know what your tw Twitter handle is. You know, I don't tweet. So I use Facebook. And I don't tweet because Learn has a ton of people who do tweet. And though I subscribe to several Twitter feeds, my Twitter handle is personal, so I don't use it for business. Uh, but if you want to see me on Facebook, it's just my, my name on Facebook. And if you want to get a hold of me, the best way to get a hold of me is by email. And then I'll hook you up however you want to be hooked up. And I'm, of course, totally happy. Those of you who are LEARN members, you get three hours of free technical assistance. For heaven's sakes, this year, 2013, if you're contract training, shoot me an email. Let's get a phone appointment. Let's do a phone call or a Skype call. And let's, let's go to work together on your problems. That's what we're here for. And if you didn't use that in 2012, this is the year to make it happen. I'm always happy to hear from you guys. Don't forget, too, that we've got the contract training only conference coming up in the first week of April in Chicago. And so if you don't know about that, just uh, call the 1-800 number for LEARN or info at learn.org and ask them to send you the link to the information on the contract training only conference, because I'll be there. And then we can. Uh, sit down, have a cup of coffee, and talk about anything that you need to know. I want to thank Chris and Augusoft uh, also today for sponsoring this webinar. It's really nice to be able to touch base with contract training friends and clients one last time as we ring out the old year and ring in the new. Great. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time as well, Julia, to present such a, another fantastic webinar. And 
thanks to everybody who took the time to, to join us today. As um, we know, it's a busy time to, as the year is winding down. So um, thanks again, everyone. And um, the information up on the screen there is um, contact info for both Learn and for Augusoft if you're interested in learning more about um, Lumens. We're, of course, more than happy to, uh, to sign you up for a demo and to get more information to you as well on that. So, um, so with that, I think we'll sign off. So thanks again, everybody, and have a, a great holiday and a very happy new year. Same to all of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>